day. I was like, oh man, I don't know. It was a um, it was somebody trying to shop at Walmart online for like two hundred dollars or something, and so. <laughs> So I get this phone call and says, you might have some fraudulent activity on your card. And so they wanted me to key in my zip code, but I didn't do it. So I just hung up and called the bank and it didn't even post. They were trying to post it. So it just, you know, but God was there to just help through it because he's always there, always looking out. And I just really praise him and thank him for who he is. And we're going to talk today about why praise God. So one of the things that happened is that I was praying because I'm praying just to praying about what to, what to preach, what to, what to bring to you all today. And the Lord in my spirit just said, continue with what you're doing. Continue with the book of Second Chronicles. And so, you know, I'm reading and doing what I need to do. And a little bit later on, I turned to, uh, in, the, um, in the app, the, the devotions for today is Second Chronicles. So you know that God is working. There ain't no, that is not a coincidence. It was completely orchestrated by him. And so again, I'm thankful, but we're going to talk a little bit about praise. And I've talked about praise before. Praise isn't just listening to someone else sing, or praise isn't just listening to music, but praise is how you live your life. When, when, when God says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, it's everything being the way God created them to be. So it's, it's, it's us acting like we're supposed to act. It's us being the people that God made. And so we don't, when we say, when we praise, we glorify God in our praise because of the way we behave because of the way that we behave. Now, we read some of this uh, last week, and I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. 2 Chronicles 20. We read just Jehoshaphat's prayer last time, and it was so funny. Um, well, it wasn't funny, but it was funny after I did because I started remembering the prayer. So when I had to go to the hospital to get blood, I'm like, well, Lord, who else can I look to except you? Just like Jehoshaphat said in his prayer, who else? Who else can I keep my eyes on except you? Because there's nothing I can do about certain things. I can only trust you. So that's a great part of his prayer. In verse 15, it reads like this. And when you, when you found it, if you could just um, stand, please. <clears throat> and it reads like this. It says, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Again, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. 
Then some Levites from the Kohites and some and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. They, as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As they began to sing in praise, the Lord set the ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they did <clears throat> they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they only saw dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, where they praised the Lord. That is why it is called Valley of Barakah to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. The fear of the Lord came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace. For God had given him rest on every side. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word, God. God, we ask that you would bless your people today. That you would open our hearts, God. That we might hear your word of truth. And Lord God, that we might understand just a little something about praise. God, we thank you that we're here today that you've seen fit that we can worship and praise one more time. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Why praise God? Well, we said that it glorifies him. When we praise, when we're, when we're acting or living like we're supposed to live, that is a praise in and of itself to God. And as we read, <clears throat> read this passage, we can see here, they praised all the time. They just worshiped and praised all the time. Some with singing, some with musical instruments, some with just leading, leading uh, the army into war, but they praised all the time. Jehoshaphat was an example to the people. He bowed down with his face to the ground and everybody fell down to worship God. So praise. My first point is that praise brings confidence in who God is. Praise brings confidence in who God is. You know, even though I was sick and I started to call some folks and say, can y'all come with me to the hospital? But then Everybody was trying to go to sleep. I got to work the next day. I was like, Lord, you know what? You'll get me there and get me back. And so I just went on and, and did what I had to do, really confident that it was okay. Of course, the people, you know, they're like, well, why didn't you call me? I'm like, because. Because I was okay. I was okay. I would have called someone or a couple of people if I knew that I couldn't get to the hospital. And I, I, was, I was really um, not, not feeling well. Couldn't think. I was, <laughs> I was doing some work earlier in the day that had to do with counting and um, just counting numbers. And 
I cannot tell you all how many times I counted the numbers over and over and over again because I was so cloudy and so tired. And, uh, but, but it was okay. Um, the Lord took care of me. He took care of me. So it's good to praise the Lord. It says, O Most High, in Psalm 92, 1. Praise is a good thing. So when we get up in the morning, it's good to praise the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for keeping me last night. Thank you. You remember the old deacons in the church used to pray? Thank you that last night wasn't my cooling board. <laughs> it's the truth. They prayed it. They prayed it all the time. I never understood it until I got a lot older. But thanking God and just giving him all the glory that he is due. Praise is a good thing. Because praise is a good thing, it means that it's pleasant is valuable and morally excellent. In Psalm 147, 1, it tells us that praise is beautiful and agreeable. You know, it's not always about listening to the radio, but a lot of times the praise that we do ought to come from scripture. You ought to look at a psalm like Psalm 145. Psalm 145 lifts up, so many of them do, but Psalm 145 is one of my favorites, favorite psalms. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Praise, praising God lifts our minds toward heaven. When we consider the reasons then why we should praise God, we find a list of his attributes from scripture. It's I find sometimes when I listen to certain songs, they don't know what they're talking about. They just don't know. You listen to them carefully, or it's just junk. Just junk stuff. And all songs that claim to be Christian are not Christian. They're just not. So try to look at the Psalms and get your praise on. God does not have to try to be God. So we said, you know, I was listening to a sermon, and it turns out, Gwen, the sermon that you had had me listen to, I listened to it before. I've heard it before, yes. And somebody corrupted it, I think, toward the end. So it was a sermon by um, Dr. Tony Evans, and he was talking about prayer in this one. But, but one, of the, one of the examples that he used is that you have to believe we were talking about, you have to believe in who God is. And he says, you know, it's, it's easier to believe in who God is because God doesn't have to try to be God. He is God. He doesn't have to try. He is God. And he was given some more examples like water doesn't have to try to be water. It's wet. It's water because that's what it is. So he was making the, the connection to God that he is who he is. So we can just say some things about who he is. One is that he's full of glory. He's filled with glory. He's heavy. Glory. The glory uh, in, in Hebrew has to do with weight. And God is heavy with glory. He's heavy with, with godness. Let's put it that way. God is great. In Psalm 145.3, God is wise and powerful from Daniel 2.20. He's good from Psalm 107.8. He's merciful and faithful in Psalm 89.1 and so much more. This is not an exhaustive uh, sermon on praise, but he pardons sin in Psalm 103, 103.1-3. He gives us our daily food in 136 and 25. To try to list all the things God has done is impossible, but it's a great exercise for us because it turns our hearts back to him and keeps us mindful of how much we owe to him, how much we owe 
to him. So praise brings us confidence in who God is. My next point, praise brings God's will to pass. Praise brings God's, God's will to pass. We could see that with Jehoshaphat. Praise brought God's will to pass. We, we read about the equipment and clothing and articles of value, more than they could carry. It took three days to collect all the plunder of the war. On the fourth day, then, they assembled in the valley of Barakah. This valley, I didn't mention it last week, but Barakah means praise. A whole valley named after God, where he worked, where he brought about his will. Amen? So what does that say? So if you praise the Lord and give him thanks and repeat a psalm and stand with confidence, then you will know that God is going to bring his will to pass. Will it look necessarily like you want it to look? No. But he will bring his will to pass in your life and do it better than you ever could and do the best, the best for you. Even though at the time, it doesn't seem like the best. But it will turn out to be the best according to his purpose. Everybody with me? And so, God opened the windows of heaven for them. He didn't only, he did not only win the war, but he opened the windows of heaven and let it rain down blessing on Judah and Jerusalem. So if I praise, I'm going to come away with a windfall of blessing. Does it necessarily mean material things? No, it does not. But it might mean that I can walk, and I can breathe, and I can think, and I just had to praise the Lord. I just had to praise the Lord, because he is good like that. Remember, I was talking last week, and I was saying that we're not made to fight battles. God fights the battles. We just stand in what? Victory. But God fights the battles. Just like it says in that passage earlier on, it says, the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord's battle. What else does praise do? My third point, praise showcases God to others. It says the fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. In the book, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus, authors Ann Spangler and Lois Tver Tverberg explore how the Jewish culture and heritage of Jesus influenced his life and ministry and how it should influence our understanding of the gospel. Spangler traveled to Israel several times while researching the Second Temple period and writing the book. Her first flight was aboard uh, the, the Israeli airline, El Al Airlines, which is the preferred method of travel for many Orthodox Jews. She writes of being fascinated by the ritual and symbolism of the Jewish faith she observed even during that flight. She said, I tried not to stare as a bearded man three rows ahead stood up and carefully began winding a long strip of leather around his, it would have been the upper arm. He was observing a daily custom among Orthodox Jews, binding small boxes called tefillin to both head and arm. These boxes, I knew, contained parchment scrolls inscribed with the ancient command recorded in Deuteronomy 6. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them upon your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. How many of you know that Orthodox Jews actually tie parchment around 
around themselves, around their heads, around their arms. He says, tie them up as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. And he says, as the young man wound the dark strand of leather around his arm, I could hear him speaking in Hebrew. Later I learned he was echoing the words of Hosea 2, 19 and 20. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In the seat next to me was a teenage girl piously bent over her prayer book. When she wasn't sleeping through the long flight, she was reading and praying, rocking rhythmically back and forth. Have you ever seen Jews in the temple and they're rocking back and forth? That's what she was doing as she read and meditated on the Hebrew words. Later, I asked a white-haired rabbi I met in Israel about this practice called <clears throat> davening the rocking motion during prayer. And I discovered this is a way of expressing that one's whole self, body, and soul is caught up with God. The rabbi explained that the movement of the body back and forth mimics the flickering flame of a candle. And she said it called to mind the saying that the candlestick of God is the soul of man. The candlestick of God is the soul of man. And so my point here is that praise showcases who God is when you praise God openly. And people begin to notice what you're doing and the God that you're lifting up. And so she had noticed Christian, but openly noted, openly was part of that praise and really could understand um, at least that people praise the Lord in earnest, in earnest, became part of, they get caught up in the praise. And so when you are praising. You know, some people don't clap. I'm not saying you have to clap. I'm not saying you have to sing out loud. I'm not saying that you have to shout. But the praise has to be infused in your spirit. It has to be infused. <laughs> you can't pay attention sometimes to the, to the person who's leading you in praise if that's, if that's the situation. You have to really kind of see the words as part of what God's doing in your life. It's not about who's up here singing. It's just not about that. What do I mean when we sing the song, I give myself away? You really have to Get yourself in a, in, a, in a mind frame to say, God, I really give myself away. I surrender my life to you. So then it becomes not about the people who are singing. It becomes about what's happening in your heart, something between you and God. Amen? It does. That's why praise and worship is so critical. And then we all, we all kind of feed off one another. Because we're all praising the same God. So praise and worship is critical. Worship of the Psalms and looking at a Psalm and just repeating it is critical. Even when you're by yourself. You've got to praise God in all situations. Praise him in all situations. So, and then, <clears throat> when other people are here with us that may not be Christians, we show them who God is by our praise. You don't know who might come to the Lord as a result of your praise and worship. Amen? Amen. So praise showcases God to others. Praise brings about the peace of God. <clears throat> it says that 
And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for God given, had given him rest on every side. Do you know that praise transforms the heart from fear to peace? Praise transforms the heart from fear to peace because I have confidence in God. I don't know how God does it, but he supernaturally acts in our praise. I don't know. I've prayed so many times and been a little apprehensive about whatever was going on. And suddenly after praising God, I ain't trying to worry about it. Because he brings peace in my heart that he's going to take care of and that he's going to handle everything in his own time. The word shalom, if you've ever heard the Jewish word shalom, it means peace. It means peace. And the kind of the concept of shalom is peace in the house. Peace in your house physically, but peace in this temple. Peace in this house. That is what shalom means. And that's what God wants to give us, peace. So praise, then, is a vital part of a life surrender to God and gives credit where credit is due. One of the songs we sing, right, Rejoice, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men in Psalm 107, 8. When we surrender, God brings about peace. When we surrender, God brings about that serenity and that, that calm that says, you know what, it's going to be okay. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to take care of it. But there's one little caveat. And we talked a little bit about it last week. Is that praise must hold hands with obedience. Praise must hold hands with obedience. God does not... You know, you've got to have a change in heart. Let's put it that way. He doesn't accept anything exalted above him. He doesn't accept anything above, uh, exalted above him. I want to, in the, in the spirit of Dr. King Day, I also want to give you an example. I'm sure Dr. King maybe wasn't thinking about this, but it's an important example. I want to, um, well, before I get there, King Jehoshaphat, and we've read this now two weeks in a row, he didn't lose his salvation, but he did lose his way. He didn't lose his salvation. You know, you can lose your, lose your, you can lose your way, but not your salvation. Okay. The king, I told you last week that he married foreign women, women who did not believe uh, in the God of Israel. And he got what? Distracted. And he began to exalt their ways over God's ways. He didn't remove the, 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 um, the places where people, the Asherah poles, exactly, where people worshipped on the hills and stuff. He didn't tear those down. And then he made an alliance with King Azahiah at the end of the chapter. We didn't read that. And he made an alliance that they would go and... In, in verse 36, he agreed with him to construct a fleet of trading ships. And then I just want to read later on. It says, because you have made an alliance with Azahiah, the Lord will destroy what you've made. And the ships were wrecked and not able to set sail to trade. Because he made an alliance with a wicked man. Okay, so that, that's a lesson in and of itself. But... In August 1963, in a letter from a Birmingham jail, written longhand, that was a long letter too, written longhand by Dr. King, he says this, one may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? 
The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. He said, I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. And he says, now what's the difference between the two? How does one determine when a law is just or unjust? A just law is man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. He says at the end here, all segregation, all segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. So in these writings, Dr. King understood that living in disobedience degrades the human personality. Any law that degrades human personality, he says, is unjust. So because of who God is, God's law is just. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law, as I read before, or the law of God. A Christian, then, that lives outside of God's will degrades the self. Anything that segregates us from God distorts the soul and damages the personality. So many of us are segregated from the things of God and we live distorted lives that don't look at all like God. So your praise, in order for your praise to really mean something, you got to do what? Be obedient. You got to live right. You have to be morally just. And morally just means there's an eternal perspective to the way that you're living. Are we perfect? No, but I ain't making no excuses. And you shouldn't make excuses either. You ought to get on it and move in a godly direction. Amen. So praise has to hold hands with obedience. Even Dr. King in his writing understood some things about what it means to live just and unjust. And, and you know, in the, in the letter from a Birmingham jail, you know, he was, um, he was responding to Christians who didn't believe that what he was doing was right. Amen. So, What are you going to do different? What are you going to do different? Are you going to stand and believe in God with confidence? Are you going to surrender what you need to surrender? Are you going to not exalt anything above him? Are you going to move things out of your life that are just trash? I'm just asking. What do y'all think? You can do something. The doors of the church are open. If you need 